Welcome to the Story Exchange. I'm Colleen DeBase. And I'm Sue Williams. For a lot of us in the Northeast, the issue of air quality finally took center stage last June when our skies turned orange. It felt almost apocalyptic. Here's PIX11 in New York. Wildfires burning in Canada have sent a smoky haze over our area. An air quality alert is in effect, and officials warning that individuals with health issues like asthma... And while this was new for New York, hazardous air conditions are certainly not new to many parts of the world. Places like Bangladesh or India or China. And even other parts of the United States. That's right. For this report, we headed to Salt Lake City, Utah, with its spectacular blue skies and pristine mountains that many of us think of as a skier's dream and a nature lover's paradise. But we found that on any given day, and sometimes without much warning, this picturesque scene can turn into a nightmare. If you're not familiar with the Salt Lake Valley, we periodically have the worst air quality in the country and occasionally the worst air quality in the world. That's Carrie Kelly. I'm an associate professor in chemical engineering at the University of Utah, and I'm also co-founder of TELUS Networked Sensor Solutions. Carrie, you might say, is an expert in dust. The dry Great Salt Lake is a huge source of dust for our valley. She's been studying the Great Salt Lake for nearly two decades. What she's seeing is disturbing. As has been widely reported, the Great Salt Lake, the largest saltwater lake in the Western Hemisphere, is vanishing, becoming drier and drier. There are huge, what they call playas, so the uh, mud flats or sand flats that when I first moved here in about 2000 were not visible. The other thing that became very apparent in the last few years are dust storms. You'll get a wall of dust coming in. These dust storms can be deadly. Here's Fox 13 in Utah. We have been reporting all week. Eight people died in a pileup on I-15 on Sunday as a result of a sudden dust storm reducing visibility to nearly zero. It was the second deadly A wall of dust is obviously dangerous if you're speeding down the highway. But even if you're not. For a healthy individual, you'll have burning eyes, coughing, irritated lungs. It's really important for folks who have compromised immune systems or compromised lung functions or asthmatics. So it's it's a big irritant, and that's something that has become evident to all residents living here. What's even more alarming is what's in the dust. Researchers such as uh, Dr. Kevin Perry at the University of Utah have looked at the composition of dust coming off the Great Salt Lake, and they have found things of concern, like elevated levels of arsenic, which is a known human carcinogen, elevated levels of copper and lead. And lead is a significant problem for children and for development, and there's really no good level of lead in the air. Last spring, Carrie took us to Antelope Island in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. We drove out on a long causeway and parked by an old marina where rows of boats were moored, stranded on muddy flats. That's where we met Kevin Perry, (laughs) the researcher Kelly just mentioned. Unfortunately, you know, the lake has dropped five feet in the last four years. The lake bed is cracked and gray. But there's also a poignant beauty to the scene, where scattered patches of shallow water still shimmer in the sunlight. So the eastern half of the lake is basically gone, and it's the western side that still remains. In two months from now, you know, what you're looking at right now, um, there would only be a very small stream moving through here, and you'd be able to literally walk all the way from here to the other side of the lake in no more than, you know, six inches of water. So, very briefly, how did it come to be in this terrible state? Okay, so there are three main factors. One is uh, climate change, so it's getting warmer. So warmer means you get more evaporation from the lake, so the level will decline. The The next thing is uh, the drought. So we have been in a historic drought. And the third thing is diversion. So diversion is water being used by the residents of the Wasatch Front, as well as the agriculture. So agriculture is responsible for about two-thirds And when you have all this dryness, when the wind kicks up, you have dust. Last spring, when we had that really bad March, April, May period with all the dust events, and you can't see across the valley, and, you know, burning eyes, coughing. And so I think people started to think, oh, yeah, there is something going on here. It's not 
like some distant thing that you can't see or or, or experience. Like, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious that it's happening. So we have a meteorological tower to measure the winds out on the lake bed to find out how strong they are. So I'm trying to understand how the dust gets lofted off of the surface and Carrie's trying to track it and figure out where it's going and how it's going to be impacting people. We'll tell you more about what Carrie is doing to help Utah deal with its terrible air quality when we come back. And we'll also tell you about some scary pushback that she's gotten along the way. Stick around. The Story Exchange is an award-winning nonprofit media platform that elevates women's voices and achievements. Our $25,000 Women in Science Incentive Prize supports female scientists addressing climate change. Find out more at thestoryexchange.org. We've been talking to Carrie Kelly, a professor at University of Utah whose air quality research is becoming nationally recognized and who's devoted her career to making sure that people understand that what they're breathing or what their kids are breathing may hurt their health. We've been focused on understanding neighborhood levels of air quality. And this is really important, especially in an area like Utah. We've been talking a lot about the Great Salt Lake and how its toxic dust is contributing to air quality problems. But there's another big issue that Utah deals with called wintertime inversions. It's unique to Utah's bowl-like topography. And if you're not familiar with the Salt Lake Valley or our wintertime inversions, what happens is in the winter, cold air settles in our valley, warm air slides over the top of that. And because we're surrounded by mountains, it acts like a lid on a bowl. And all the pollution that we emit during that time sort of cooks in that bowl. Yuck. Yeah. And so if you live in Utah, you often hear weather reports like this. In the sky, even with that poor air quality that we had today, we're at moderate air quality alerts. We've got some inversion conditions going on with a cold air. It's more dense and it just sinks down. And then we have this warmer air aloft and Nothing really mixes out, so we get stuck with the hazy conditions, and that's what we A few years back, around 2013, when Carrie was working on her PhD, her work led to an unexpected discovery related to air pollution. We're not a particularly polluting city. It's just that we're a, a populated city, and we're surrounded by mountains, and we're cold in the winter, so... When people are cold, they burn fires. We discovered that wood burning was a significantly larger contributor than was originally thought. So it was a good and bad. The good thing is it's something you could do something about. It's something you could do something about relatively quickly. So if you could get people to not burn wood during poor air quality periods, then that could actually move the needle a little bit. At the time, Carrie was serving on the State Air Quality Board. Her findings led the board to draw up proposals to limit wood burning. But those proposals were met with huge opposition. The Air Quality Board had seven hearings. They were packed with, you know, something between 200 to 500 people, standing room only. People were furious. They felt like this was a big infringement on their rights. I did chair, I think, two of the meetings with the angry crowds. And so, you know, sometimes people dislike you, and that's part of living and growing up. But I had never before experienced, like, that much vehement dislike of me. The members of the Air Quality Board were getting thousands of messages. Were you ever scared? Um, you know, when I got the phone call from the person who said, I'm watching you, I got my eye on you, you know, you start to get like the hairs on the back of your neck. You're like, I'm like, oh, it was pretty intimidating. Fortunately for the public's health, Carrie and the board did not cave. They worked with the state to find ways to make the proposals more acceptable to the public. And in the end, the state did begin restricting wood burning on some winter days. Fast forward five years later, we went back and looked at the filters again and saw what had happened over time. And the contributions from wood burning have declined dramatically. So from something like 10% down to like 2 or 3%. So we've made great strides. In recognition of her work, the governor of Utah and the Utah Clean Air Partnership presented Carrie with a big award at a 2018 ceremony. For expertise, efforts, and dedication of Champion Clean Air, it is our pleasure to name Dr. Carrie Kelly as the 2018 UK Air Clean Air Person of the Year. 
I want to pause for a second here and acknowledge that while Carrie did eventually get the recognition she deserved, it wasn't easy. The pushback, the threats, the intimidation, all of that's something that environmental activists, particularly women, face whenever they advocate for change. Yeah, it's been documented by the watchdog group Global Witness that 39% of climate scientists reported online harassment or abuse related to their work. And that's particularly the case with women, who say they even get threats of sexual violence. Another report by the United Nations in 2021 found that climate activists, even young ones like the Greta Thunbergs of the world, are subject to hate campaigns and vicious online attacks that are often rooted in misogyny and sometimes racism. Setting all that aside, getting people and institutions, whether it's consumers, ordinary citizens, governments, or giant corporations, to change their behavior is exactly what it's going to take to save the planet. Which gets us back to Carrie in Utah. That's right. Carrie invited us to check out her university lab, where she and her team are developing better technology for monitoring air pollution. In about 2017, 2018, I became interested in low-cost air quality sensors. So the sensors we were using, and in fact, the sensors that almost everyone is using to look at particle pollution, do a really crappy job at dust. Carrie and a colleague, Pierre-Emmanuel Gaillardon, started building more sensitive sensors. And this one also has the capability to use the I2C connector that allows us to measure CO2. That, that's right, yeah. We built in uh, capabilities to install uh, extension sensors. Yeah, cool. She showed us one. This sensor is a little bit larger, it's more powerful, and it is set up in a way that'll allow you to measure dust from the Great Salt Lake. Most sensors are about the size of smoke alarms. It will transmit the readings to an offline database in the cloud. Okay, it does that every two minutes. It also has a GPS so that you know where the sensor is. Also gives us time. So a timestamp is really important for all the measurements. Pro is, uh, is really been designed to be a modular platform. Yeah, awesome. So you can essentially tweak that to your, your research needs. Right. Uh, a colleague approached us who was in pediatrics and he said, oh, I've got some funds. We would love to put your sensors in the homes of 200 asthmatics. And could you make me them? And I was like, yeah, let's figure out how to do this. Pierre and I were like on Saturday afternoon assembling sensors and packaging them and sending them out. And that was clearly not scalable. To better handle orders and clients, Carrie and Pierre formed a company, TELUS Network Sensor Solutions. Now that the cost and the quality of air quality sensing have come down to sort of a reasonable level that it's accessible to the community, I think there are a lot of great opportunities to take better control of your health. And could you just give me maybe just ideal clients or people who you target? So child care centers could potentially really use these type of, of sensors. They're cost effective. Children are growing and they breathe more rapidly than we do, so they're more susceptible to pollutants. Carrie's very concerned about student athletes who often practice outdoors, doing really vigorous activity and potentially drawing contaminated air deep into their lungs. And one challenge is right now there aren't guidelines. So for example, if you live in Nephi, Utah, and you're coming up to Salt Lake to play a game, should you move the game to Nephi because of the air quality? I mean, should I have my athletes train inside? Carrie recently won a $1 million grant from the National Science Foundation to install air sensors. So the idea is to put them on athletic fields. Our goal is ultimately to have it on every high school athletic field in the state. Carrie and her team are working with a number of partners. Sort of a dizzying array of partners. The State Board of Education, the Utah High School Activities Association, the Utah Athletic Trainers Association. So we are very excited about it, a little nervous, because um, universities are not set up to spend a million dollars in one year and be effective at it. So we're working really hard. Well, this is great news. Carrie is once again worried that she might be facing pushback, especially once the air sensors are installed on athletic fields, as practices or games might need to be canceled or delayed because of air quality conditions. I didn't realize this, but a lot of coaches and parents don't care. Like, they want their kid out there playing. Even though on some days, athletic trainers tell her, you know, we have this problem where you know, sometimes air quality is really bad here because of wildfire smoke or dust events. We can't see across the field. And in many places in this state, in actually 17 of 29 counties, there's no air quality forecast and there's no reliable measurement of air quality. 
in anticipation of pushback, perhaps from parents or coaches or maybe even athletes themselves, her team now includes a communications expert. So trying to craft messages that will help people kind of understand the issue and then understand like, okay, you know, it's not for that long. We can just take mitigation efforts and then, you know, we'll be back out tomorrow. The project is so timely as we're seeing more and more air quality events, not just in Utah, but here in New York and many places. And the work that Carrie is doing can perhaps provide some guidance for us the next time clear skies turn into a dirty haze. As we wrap up this episode, I want to go back to a conversation I had with Carrie and Kevin as we stood looking at the Great Salt Lake, which environmental experts believe could dry up entirely within five years. While maybe we can adapt to the changes we're seeing, in a better world, it wouldn't be happening in the first place. How do you feel when you when you think about the big picture of this situation and you look at at this scene that's kind of magically beautiful and yet terribly sad. It affects me in a big way. Um, Every single time I come out here, I see something new and different, and it expands my understanding of nature. And the thought that this oasis in the desert is about to be lost forever is just something that really pains me on a personal level. Well, I think a day like today, it's stunning. It's green, there's more water in the lake than there normally is, but it is disturbing. And I mean, on the positive side, we can actually do something about it. There is enough conservation that could be done that could fix this, could bring this back to a healthy level. We can alter how we use water and we can recover, but it's not gonna happen in a year or two or even a decade. Uh, It's gonna take, you know, several decades in order to fully recover the lake. We all need to do something. So I think individuals need to do things, but we need important actors, whoever they are, you know, corporations, religious organizations, whoever, to make big, bold steps that are gonna help us get at this problem. We do need big, bold steps. We thank Carrie and Kevin and Pierre for talking with us. And we thank you for listening. This has been The Story Exchange. Join us next time to hear more stories about innovative and inspirational women doing the things you'd never dream of. Or maybe you would. If you like this podcast, please share on social media or post a review wherever you listen. It helps other people find the show. And visit our website at thestoryexchange.org where you'll find news, videos, and tips for entrepreneurial women. And we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line at info at thestoryexchange.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I'm Colleen DeBase. Sound editing provided by Nusha Balian. Interview recorded by Thomas Conzo. Production coordinator is Noelle Flago. Executive producers are Sue Williams and Victoria Wong. Our mixer is Pat Donahue at Stringing Can, recorded at Cutting Room Studios in New York City. <laughs>